everyone, Courtney here, and in this video I'm going to discuss section B of Hegel's Phenomenology of Spirit called Self-Consciousness. I'm just filming from my playroom because we have pot lights here and the sun has gone down, so hopefully the lighting is somewhat tolerable, but, um, but anyway, in this section, um, Hegel discusses how the conscious mind comes to arrive at a higher level of understanding of oneself that could properly be referred to as self-consciousness, and as we're going to see in this section, for Hegel, self-consciousness is not something that's just inherent in a living creature, but it's something that the conscious mind has to go through a struggle and a process in order to attain. So I'm going to start off with giving this a really high level overview without any details for those of you who just want to get the gist of it, and then I will go through in more detail um, and discuss his reasons for saying these things. In this section, the first attempt of the conscious mind to try to define itself or attain self-consciousness is to define itself as absolute other to everything else, and that won't prove to be so simple. And if you're thinking, okay, he's already talked about this, the difference is that in the first section, he talked about this with regards to the apparent um, certainty of the sensory world, but that ended up coming back in on itself full circle, right? So now he's talking about all of this with regards to to uh, the self, right? He says that it is to itself its own object, um, so so self-consciousness or self-awareness. So uh, anyway, so all this to say, yeah, the first uh, thing that happens in this section is the conscious mind trying to attain self-consciousness by defining itself as absolute other. It doesn't prove to be that simple. Next, the conscious mind tries to define itself or attain self-consciousness by defining itself as one with everything else. That doesn't turn out to be so simple or straightforward either. Moving on from there, it tries to define itself as both of those things, or understanding them in unity, or as desire, as he puts it, but that also won't prove to be so simple, and he concludes that in order to satisfy the demands of self-consciousness, that a conscious mind must come into contact with another consciousness. Now, I'm going to go through this in more detail to explain this uh, properly, or, or flesh out what he's saying, because the writing is kind of convoluted. Um, and also just to make sure that we're on the same page, like that, uh, that I got it right. So let me know as always, whether you agree with my interpretation. So in paragraph 166, in the first paragraph, Hegel begins by reiterating that he writes in the previous modes of certainty, the true for consciousness is something other than itself, but the concept of this true vanishes in the experience of it. So he's reiterating the fact that when we actually took a look at the sensory world, right, which seemed to be indifferent to whether it was perceived or not, right, in which case that would support the idea that you're completely separate, um, actually it turned out that that was completely mediated. And therefore it's not so simple to just try to say that you've attained self-consciousness or some kind of high awareness of oneself uh, by defining oneself completely as others. So that cannot be the essence of self-consciousness for Hegel. The other thing that he mentions here is, he says, and this, he has a crazy sentence for this, um, but he concludes that being in itself and being for an other are the same. And I think what he's getting at is that to even to try to define yourself in terms of being absolutely other to everything else, it's almost got this self-refuting quality about it in that it implies the necessity of that everything else as being essential to what you are. And so ultimately he concludes that it turns out that the I overarchs this other. So at this stage, the conscious mind tries to define itself or achieve self-consciousness by saying that it is one with everything. And um, in paragraph 167, he starts off saying, with self-consciousness then, we have now entered the native realm of truth. And that's of course because the conscious mind, after casting its attention outwards of the world, has now been drawn back in on itself. So. So now it tries to understand itself as, as being one with everything. But the problem, Hegel says in, in paragraph 167, is that we end up with a motionless tautology, he says, of I am I. It tried to differentiate itself from something which turns out to be itself still. So that didn't work. So we can't say for Hegel that I am one with everything, or I am I is the essence of self-consciousness. Um, we just end up with the tautology, he says, and so that cannot be the essence of self-consciousness. Now, the other thing he says, and I can't remember if it's here or later on, is that is that um, the understanding yourself in terms of one with everything else implies as well the first moment of otherness 
And we can't just discard that first moment of otherness when it comes to the essence of self-consciousness. So, so um, it cannot on its own to, to describe yourself as one with everything, get at the essence of self-consciousness either. So again, that on its own um, is not achieving self-consciousness. So at this point, he turns his attention to desire. He says, i.e., uh, self-consciousness is desire in general. At least that's how it presents itself at this point. Now, when I first read that for the unsuspecting reader, such as myself, um, I was like, what does he mean, like, is desire in general? Like, desire for, for what? Um, and then uh, I remembered that Kant talks about the faculty of desire. So I think I'm pretty, I'm pretty sure that Hegel must be referring to what Kant had talked about. And I googled this um, to get more clarity. And Kant says that that um, desire, the faculty of desire, is the self-determination of a subject's power through the representation of something. So I'm going to suggest that Hegel here is referring to what Kant said, and Kant ascribed this desire, right, or in other words, the self-determination of a subject's power through the representation of something to all animals. But for Hegel, it's not as simple and clear cut as Kant seems to have made it out to be, but rather um, it seems, I think for Hegel, that you could be a, a living thing without necessarily having achieved any meaningful level of self-consciousness. And I say that because in one paragraph, I wonder if I can find it for you, he, he says that um, this unity itself, this concept divides itself into the opposition of self-consciousness and life. So that's what I think he's getting at there with this discussion of desire. So from this point onwards, he goes into a, a discussion of what it is to be a living creature. And I didn't actually go through this um, enough times to give you a really concise summary. I'll just give you his conclusion on page 171 because it clearly is going to follow a similar process to all of this other stuff where, you know, we try one thing and it's negated and, um, and then, you know, there seems to be unity, but that's not the whole picture. And um, basically, he concludes with regards to life in paragraph 171, he says, it is this whole cycle that constitutes life, not what was expressed at the outset, the immediate continuity and solidity of its essence, nor the subsistent shape and discrete being for itself, nor the pure process of these, nor even the simple combination of these moments, but rather the whole that develops itself and dissolves its development and in this movement simply maintains itself. So take from that what you will. Maybe it would make more sense to me had I gone through the paragraphs in more detail. Um, perhaps I can flesh that out for you properly in another video as to why he would come up with that definition of what that really does mean. Um, but for now, that's just what he concludes. And he also concludes that basically self-consciousness in this case just keeps... Um, crashing in on itself, basically collapsing in on itself, he says. And so what he concludes here is that in order to satisfy the demands of self-consciousness, it achieves its satisfaction only in another self-consciousness. Now, again, had I read this in more detail, maybe I would be able to support that point for you a little bit more. I read online that um, it has to do with the fact that, well, you are a subject to yourself, that to another conscious mind, you are... Uh, an object and so it's it's coming to terms with these different perspectives on yourself that really helps arrive at the next stage of self-awareness that one can properly call um, self-consciousness so that sounds like it would probably make sense so that's as far as I got in this section um, so thank you so much for watching oh and before I go I will respond to some questions I got one question in my last video which says um, when Hegel is taking us through the consciousness stages who or what is experiencing the consciousness development? Human beings, God, the universe, something else, or some combination of all of these? As usual, there may not be an answer. That is such a good question, because um, clearly from the initial um, part of the book, this first part of the book, he's of course talking about the individual conscious mind, but um, as we all know, it's, it's part of this greater whole. So I guess um, I think that all of your answers are correct. I think Hegel, you know how he keeps saying that like, oh, you know, something can be true and false at the same time. Like, I think if we tried to say, oh yeah, it's the individual conscious mind. It's, it's one of those things that again, for Hegel is like true and false at the same time. 
And I was watching this video by, by Theory and Philosophy where it says part of the brilliance of these works is that like you can just, because of that kind of like never having fully achieved itself philosophy, um, is that like, oh, it's always relevant because they can just keep saying that like, um, you know, it's just the next step in, in this like progress and that reminds me of that. So getting back to your question, I think those are all good answers. Perhaps they are all true and false at the same time and understanding that in unity is what Hegel is trying to say. Um, let me know whether you agree. Uh, another question I got uh, on Instagram, this was sort of separate from reading Hegel, was if I could do um, surfism next. Uh, sure, like I, I don't know what that is, but I would be more than happy to find out or learn more about what you call philosophical surfism. And um, uh, the reason why I haven't been jumping between books is because they really do take a lot of time and patience to read. And I think when I started my channel, I you know, had one video on Kant and then like another one on Nietzsche and then they were like all of these unfinished projects. So I'm really trying to just hone in on one book at a time, even if it does take a little longer. But eventually I will finish this book and then move on to the next one. Um, another question I got uh, from a friend is what, um, what is, sorry, is knowledge relative for Hegel? Um, so I think that's a good question. Uh, I, I think, again, it's just one of those things where he would probably say there's a relative component to knowledge insofar as what's true for one person could not be true for the next person, but there's also this, um, this objective component to knowledge in terms of understanding it, all of those in like their unity. Um, that is what I think he might say about whether or not knowledge is is relative that it both is and isn't so i know this is like really confusing but um that's the best answer i can give so go ahead and comment below on what you think of these answers uh so that's um about it so thank you so much for watching uh let me know what you think of this video below and i will see you guys next time